Thanks for coming and spending the time with us. Welcome to True Wellness. Is there anybody here I've never met? Sure, a few. Hello. Anybody else just for fun? Everybody knows to do it. That's fun. Hello. So tonight's uh, workshop is a workshop we do typically once a year, and we're going to really touch on the emotional component and how our emotions affect our health. And I'm going to do it differently tonight uh, than other workshops I've done in the past about the emotions. So there's a couple of things I really want to try and uh, have us understand and kind of get through, <clears throat> and then open up to a lot of questions, hopefully. So I never, almost never do this, but I actually have some notes with me tonight. I saw that look. Yeah. Yes, they all, yeah, because it's terrible with doing notes. But I want to put this up so we understand something. One of the primary things I want you to understand when it comes to emotions and how they affect our health is to understand that emotions affect our physiology. And that's been proven in all kinds of ways scientifically. I'm not really going to get into the deeper stuff that way tonight. You can look that up. There's plenty of information in regards to that. Um, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she's a medical doctor in uh, New Zealand, wrote a fabulous book all about how emotions affect the body. It's a real easy read, but it's, it's very uh, informative. So just as a general um, agreement among us all tonight, can we agree that and, and understand that emotions affect the physiology? OK, yes. So anybody that goes, that's just hogwash. It's not true. Because they've done studies with um, even hormones where if you walk up to someone and shake their hand and smile and say it's good to see you, their cortisol level will actually raise up. So that quickly, that quickly, emotions affect our physiology. <clears throat> There's been a lot of research done in regards to the emotional world and how it affects our body. And one of the things they found is that emotions are not, nor, and, and, you know, I'll get sidetracked tonight for sure, nor are, is memory, so emotions, I'm going to go out and limp. Memory and emotions are not in your brain. They affect your brain, but they're not stored in your brain. They don't manifest from the brain. And a lot of us were taught that they really do. It's all in your head, okay? It's not in your head, but it is in your body. Emotions, <clears throat> as far as we can tell to this point with all the research and study that's been done and, and even the work that I've done over the last 20 years in, in this world uh, with, with emotions and the body, it appears that Asian philosophy and Chinese medicine particularly uh, had assigned certain emotions to certain organs in the body. And uh, Western research got a hold of this, medicine got a hold of it, and they did a lot of studies, and they found that there's something called a neuropeptide. We'll get scientific for a second. These neuropeptides, they feel are responsible for the chemical experience of emotions in your body, and they're stored in our organs. So what I want to do is I'm going to list some primary organs for us, and we're going to list some of the primary emotions that are attached to those organs, and we'll go from there, okay? So, here comes the new. <laughs> These are not all the organs in your body. I'm going to give us the general ones and try and hit the general emotions that are attached to them. I mean, are you yeah. going to tell us where memory is? Yes, sure, I'll tell you where memory is, yes. Okay, so I'm going to abbreviate all of this stuff. We'll do the best we can. Stomach, spleen, pancreas, okay? Stomach, spleen, pancreas. Large intestine and lung. These are grouped together. These are grouped together. Kidney and bladder. heart and small intestine. And they're the primaries. Now, each group of these organ sets have been assigned different emotions to the body. Stomach, spleen, pancreas really relates to uh, low self-esteem, lack of control of events, distrust, Discussed, and they're just some of the primaries that are manifested in those organs for us. Large intestine and lung, they share a bunch of emotions as well. Typically, grief and sadness are the primaries to these.
kidney and bladder is all about fear, dread, and what's called paralyzed will. Feeling like I really want to do something or say something, but when the opportunity shows up, I can't get it out. I can't express it. Heart and small intestines. I'm going to look at this one because there's a lot of them. And if you notice, what I'm putting up here would appear to be, quote unquote, negative emotions. There's also positive emotions attached to all of these as well. Heart and small intestine is a feeling of lost, vulnerable, abandoned, deserted. And remember something about heart, we'll get into it in a second. There's also another emotion in there. Love. We'll throw that one in because it's, it's important. It's, it's real important. So these are the primary organs. These are some of the primary emotions that are generated through those organs. Everybody with me? Easy. Yes? How about questions just about that at this point? Really? Okay. okay. So I know a lot of folks in the office that come in and, and, and do uh, different biological therapies with us have seen that before and have heard that before and, and understand that. And I know uh, a lot of the staff here is well aware of those primary organs and primary emotions that we deal with. Here's what they haven't seen yet. Because I didn't know until last night. Everybody have that written down? You have that written down? Yeah. Oh, that's liver. Huh? Right? Liver too. It's not a big one. Didn't I throw liver no. in there? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, so. <coughs> liver and gallbladder. She's awesome. Very important. They're responsible for anger and resentment. Thanks, Laura. Beautiful. Thank you. Now, there's your primaries. There's your primary organs and our primary emotions related to those organs. Everybody's got it? Because I'm going to erase it. And Lori's going to help me put it back up. <laughs> Lori's been waiting for you to write that list up there for about three years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Oh. Find a magic one. Who was I talking to tonight about red? They're forcing me to use red. Okay. You yeah. might, you might, there you might go. See that? You did. <laughs> okay. Everybody see that? Y'all know what that is? Circle. Circle. <laughs> that's us. That's us. Everybody in the room, that's us. That is going to represent who we are the day we hit the planet. This is, I want this to represent my favorite word now, babyhood, okay? This is babyhood, okay? And when we're in babyhood, okay, we have organs in our body, right? And therefore, we have those primary emotions in there too, right? So, Lori's going to help me. There's, there's a liver in here, right? So that's some anger, resentment stuff. Everybody hang tough. I have lungs, right? That's some grief and sadness stuff. I've got a bladder. Everybody know babyhood's got a bladder, right? Bladder and kidney, that's fear stuff. Small intestines. What else, Lord? Heart. Heart, thank you. So we've got that ability to feel vulnerable and abandoned and deserted and alone, okay? Uh, yeah, stomach, spleen. Thank you. Pancreas. Yeah, stomach, spleen, pancreas. Okay, that's all the low self-esteem stuff. And do we do heart? Large intestine. Large, oh, large intestine. Large intestine and lung, right? Kidney. Kidney's in there, okay. Bladder. Kidney, bladder. <clears throat> that's the paralyzed will, fear, okay? So, they're all in there. There are primaries, just like the primary colors for us. If I want to make a lot of different colors, I can take the primaries, mix them up, and create other colors. Well, it's the same thing with our emotions. We've got the primaries, but they'll blend and mix to give us secondary emotions. Makes sense, right? Everybody with me? Okay, now here's the cool thing. When we're in this state, and the baby feels anger, okay? That anger comes out like that. 
And do you think mom knows that the baby's angry? There's some expression of anger, right? He's kicking, he's, right, okay. Or, or maybe, maybe there's fear, okay? Maybe there's a fear and the fear comes out and the fear comes out as crying, okay? Maybe there's fear that mom's not there, that my needs aren't going to be met. What's happening is, is that if we're in this state, those emotions come through to the outside world and are expressed. Everybody with me? Everybody see, anybody ever see a baby that looks sad? It's just sad. Okay, we're fearful, right? And for me, when I think about this, especially with children, and I believe this with adults too, I think there are two primary emotions, the two biggies, love and fear. And if you start to think about the two, you can almost put all the other emotions being triggered by one or the other, okay? And when we talk about love, because for me, in all honesty, the primary emotion in every human being, the ground, is actually the love emotion. And when we talk about the love emotion, it's not the romantic love. It's really important to distinguish that. It's not the romantic love that we so often seek and are told by the media to seek. Because if you think about it, we've almost all been there. I would say we've all been there. Have you ever loved somebody? And then, like that, go, I hate him. I hate him and never want to see him again. I can't believe that I did that to me. And that love immediately turns to hate. Have you ever had that happen? You ever know anybody that's had that happen? Yeah. Right? Have you ever, you know, had a boyfriend or girlfriend like, I never want to see you again, ever. I hate you. I never want to see you again. Last week you loved me. This is what I call small love or romantic love. The love we're talking about here is the love of compassion. And wait on it, it's in my mind. <laughs> uh, compassion. I should have wrote it down, say like last night. <laughs> wait, I got it. It's not Huh? No, don't put stuff in my head yet. Hold on. <laughs> and because, okay, ready? Ready? I'm gonna, somebody asked me. Somebody asked me. I'm gonna, so you said, are you going to tell us where memory is? Didn't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know where memory is? Anybody? Yeah. It's not in your body. It's not in your body at all. Yeah, it's, not, it's actually out in outside my body. So this information is there, and I just got to go find it for a second. So compassion. <laughs> I know. We'll get there. Hold on. <laughs> starts with a D. It's a great word. Don't put words in It means, it means, it means, I'll tell you what, oh, I got it, you ready? It doesn't start with a D, this is my dyslexia. I want, it, yeah, the love I'm talking about is compassion and benevolence. Oh. Compassion and benevolence. You all know what that means? Mm -hmm. To really give without wanting anything back. To Mother Teresa was compassionate and benevolent. Okay, she wasn't rich. Nobody, nobody exonerates her for her bank account. But if I say Mother Teresa, you all go, oh, <laughs> right. If I go Jesus, everybody goes, oh, compassion, and benevolence, right? He died for us. So that's the kind of love I'm talking about. That's the kind of love, believe it or not, that your military has. Believe it or not, the guys that get into the service and actually want to do that, do it from a place of Compassion and benevolence. They are willing to die for those they don't know. And I have not honest to goodness, I never met anybody that went very far in the service that was like, I want to be Rambo. Let's go kill stuff. I never met that guy. Never met that guy. Met a lot of guys that were willing to take a bullet for people they didn't know. And, and an idea. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about love. Okay? That's the love, as far as I'm concerned, that is manifested in babyhood. Okay? It's the love that a child is born with. It's the love that a mama has for that baby. That's the kind of love we're talking about. Not the love that's fleeting and, and, and fickle. Okay? Because it's not really true. Okay, so, everybody with me on this? Yes? Good. Here we go again. Oh man, these markers are getting me. Do I have a marker that's got power? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And the marker thing is really an inside joke. <laughs> I can tell you that story. But it's okay. Okay. Hey, there it is again. So there we are. But now in our minds, because I don't, I want to put other stuff in there. We realize all my organs are in there. All my primary emotions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. So let's just back up for one second and pretend that we're going to break it down to just two. Okay, for sake of conversation. Okay. 
let's pretend we have love and fear, okay? They're the biggies. Everything kind of moves between those two on some level. Because when I'm sad, when I'm really sad that someone's passed away, okay, you could trace that back to a fear of not having them with me ever again, not being able to communicate with them again. Usually it's a fear of that, oh my God, I don't know where they went someday, that's happening to me fear. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be traced back to those two things. I can have a lot of fears because I love them so much. But oftentimes, if you really investigate that, it's like, it's a loss, I'm, I'm gonna miss them, okay? All valid stuff. Remember this, guys, there's no, there's no emotions that are invalid. Emotions are the response of the physiology to my filter, to what's happening to me. So, here's this beautiful babyhood experience where we all were at some point. And let's pretend that our primary emotions were love and fear. We know there's a blend of all different colors in there. But let's just go with that for a second, okay? Here's, I'm going to show you what happens to us. Now it's going to get cool. I'm going to show you what happens to us. Everybody's going to help me spell tonight, too. <laughs> or I'll just, I'll just write some way I can actually read it. <laughs> okay. First thing that shows up is family programming. Okay? So uh, here I am. I'm this wonderful ball of energy, love, and fear. And the first thing that starts to show up is family programming. So what is that? Well, you know, come on. That's mom. That's dad. I have a belief that it's also grandmom and grandpa, great grandmom and grandpa, great, all the way back, all the way back, there's an energetic um, passing on of how I deal with certain things. What my family has taught me, it, even on a cellular level, how I vibrate comes first from this family programming. I start to get information. What makes daddy happy? What makes mommy happy? If I cry, I get this. If I yell, I get that. And it, we start to interact, and we start to program it. We can't help it. I'm looking forward to programming this new baby. I'm trying to do some different stuff. But that's what, I mean, you can't avoid it. Everybody with me? It's a ground floor. We all go through that. Even if I don't have parents, that genetic code, that cellular information is there. Even if I was adopted, you know, and then those parents disappeared and I was picked up by somebody else. I mean, it doesn't matter. There's still a family programming. Okay? Okay. Okay, here we go. Care? Ready? Social. I will see. I am. I'll see how he says. <laughs> the next one that we look at is social dogmas. The society and their beliefs Okay, we're Americans, we do this, we do that. There's all kinds of social mores and social dogma that we start to have to abide by. You can't get away from it. And it doesn't matter where we're at. It doesn't matter what society you're in. I don't care if we're talking about the Amazon, huts in, uh, in uh, Cambodia. Everybody goes through family programming and social dogma. Okay? Yeah, environment. Now, that's a broad subject. What do I mean by environment? Well, I mean, yeah, the environment you're actually living in. Like, you know, I was brought up in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, in Bucks County. It's part of my environment. I also have an internal environment. Okay, so if I've been dosed with antibiotics for a very long time, it changes my internal environment. That affects my emotions. Mm, yes, it does. If I'm, if I'm uh, toxic with heavy metal loads because of what I did in my industry, that's a part of my environment, and that's going to affect me on an emotional level. So the environment we grew up in is real important. Hey, was the family programming a good environment? Right? Because these things are going to move around. Is my social dogma and my environment uh, matching up with my family programming? Is there consistency <laughs> in that? Okay? So then there's this, the last one. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, PP experience. Remember, we're babyhood. <laughs> Personal and perceived experiences. Things that have actually happened to me and the things that I think have happened to me. That which has been perceived and that which has actually occurred. 
So there's experiences. Now, what have we noticed? We all end up living in a box. We all end up living in a box that's been made by social dogma, environment, my personal experiences perceived or real, and my family programming. Holy mackerel. Wait, I'm filled with love and fear. Here's what happens. Remember before, when those four walls were not around us, when I felt something, I expressed it to the outside world. So if I felt love, the outside world felt that love. I expressed it. If I felt fear, the outside world felt my fear. In babyhood, this is real, guys. That's real, man. Because I held a beautiful baby today. And she just gave me all kinds of love, all kinds of love. And if I walk away, if I disappear, and she starts to cry, that is fear that she do not see mommy anymore. And she'll let you know right away. Okay? So, without now, here's what happens. So if I have this love, or if I have this fear, it comes out and it hits an experience wall. And it takes that experience wall, and, and if we're really healthy, if we're really emotionally and physiologically healthy, that fear comes out, and guess what? It's expressed as fear. That's a healthy individual. Find me, find me one. Find me one, because here's actually what occurs because of these walls. <clears throat> the fear is expressed from my core. This is my core emotional reality who I am, deep inside, that, that love and compassion, right? That benevolence and compassion, who we really are. Because you're all Mother Teresa's. It's just these four things have stopped you from doing that. She broke through some of this. Said, I don't care about the social dogmas. I'm going to the poorest places in India, and I'm going to eat with the untouchables. I don't care what they say. So she broke through. She broke through some of that stuff. So what happens to us, though, typically, is that I feel fear, the fear comes out, it hits the wall of experience. It goes, well, you've had that experience before. And it bounces around, and it bounces down to my family programming. How did mom and dad deal with fear? And then maybe it bounces again, it goes all the way to social dogma. Hey, you're a boy, what are you afraid of? You shouldn't be afraid of anything. Buck up. <clears throat> and then it, it bounces back, maybe it touches the wall of my core again, and two things can happen. It can bounce away and come through. And often when this occurs, it doesn't come out as fear, it comes out as uh, laughter. Now what? 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 That's ridiculous. It's an inappropriate response to an emotional experience. I mean, I, there's been times, there's been times where I've done something dumb, fall down, hurt myself, and kill glass. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know she's not laughing at the fact that I tripped over the dog. It's a response. She could just as easily cry over that. Oh my God. It's just an emotional reaction. Okay? So, here's the other thing that happens. Let's say we're feeling sadness. Okay? And sadness comes out, and it bounces around, and it's the environment issue, it hits the dogma. And it bounces back, <coughs> instead of actually penetrating and going out into the world, is even an inappropriate response. It was fear, but it came out as laughter. It was sadness, but it came out as whatever. Okay? It'll shift. If it bounces around and ends up bouncing back into the core, it intensifies. It's never released. And what we find is that, for instance, sadness will bounce around and come back in and end up being depression. The person will start to feel depressed. Now oftentimes, really, sadness, I'll be honest with you, sadness rarely does it. It actually turns into something else. What typically turns into depression is anger. Anger comes out and bounces around. If it bounces back in, you get depressed. Depression is, a, is actually an unexpressed anger for people. Okay, now, you can say, well, you know, uh, I lost my whole family in, in, in a plane crash and I'm depressed. That's true. That's true. But if you, if you deep it, keep digging in there, you'll find that there's a lot of anger around that. A lot of anger around that kind of loss. So what happens, guys, is that we, don't, we have an inability suddenly to really express the primary core emotions. And they bounce around these different things. And if they pop out, they typically pop out inappropriately. It goes both ways. We have experiences. 
that drive in different emotions. We have social dogmas that drive in different emotions. We have environmental stressors that absolutely affect our emotions. Family programming that affect our emotions. So here's this wheel that starts to happen to us. And if this all starts to clog up with those things that are unexpressed, it gets pretty crowded in there. It gets pretty crowded in there, and here's what happens typically. When it gets real crowded and stuff is bouncing around and not really being directly expressed, there's a couple of primary things that show up. Depression is one of them. Anger is typically another. Hold on, I gotta remember. <clears throat> Oh yeah. Anxiety is a big one. And here's the other one. What's called non-emotive. Mm -hmm. So people end up having this happen to them, okay? And then a couple of things shows up. Either I'm non-emotive, nothing comes out. I don't feel them anymore. I've had people, I've had typically this is a big one for men. I've had guys sit down and go, emotions? I have no emotions. Okay. <laughs> really? Do you think you have no emotions? Yeah, I have no emotions. Well, that's not true. You're not feeling your emotions, but you have emotions. That's like saying I have no electricity running through my body. Hey, there's two things that are different between a living person and a non-living person. One, no electrical circuitry is running through their body. We hook them up to an EKG or a brainwave thing, there's no electricity. The other is, I've not experienced a cadaver that has any emotions. <laughs> they are pretty non-emotive. You can tap them, talk to them, whack them, there's just not a lot going on. Okay. So, you know, we, we hope not anyway, right on. Well, you better start CPR. So, you know, they don't have emotions, they don't have electricity running through them. So you have them, if you're alive, if you're alive, we have emotions. We are emotional creatures, and it can be proven all day long. And here's one of the biggest ways to understand it. None of us buy anything on facts. We buy everything on emotions. We buy everything through stories. A lot of you are here because someone said, you ought to go see this guy. It's really, he's helped me a lot. They didn't tell you what I do. They just gave you a story and said, he fixed my belly. I don't know why. And so that's the story, okay? So nobody cares about the facts. You buy a car. Nobody cares about the facts. They give you the facts in the last 30 seconds of the end of the commercial. Always. But if she tells a great story about the last client that bought a Beamer from her and how much they loved it, and oh my God, I want that too. I want to feel that way. Commercials are all about making you want to feel that way. I'll buy that if it makes me feel a certain way. That's why we go to Disneyland and Disney World. Because it makes me feel a certain way. It's why people buy alcohol. It's why people get involved with drugs. It's all about, can you make me feel a certain way? You can pile all the facts on someone all day long who's a heroin addict, and I'll tell you right now, they don't care. It makes them feel a certain way. They don't care about the facts. So we're the same way. So understand that we are driven, literally driven, moment to moment, day to day, 24-7, on our emotional, what's called the emotional reality, what the body thinks is happening. I look at it like a filter a lot of times. Oh, stuff's happening to me all the time. My body's filtering. My body's expressing. It has to. has to deal with it. And so how is it doing that? Well, it's either doing it by expressing it. Hey, you were late for the appointment. It messes with my schedule. I'm mad at you in the next five. I'm mad at five, five minutes. I'm mad. But I let it all out and I go, okay, let's go to work. Now there's nothing between us. Okay? But if she comes in and she's five minutes late and I'm all, ar, 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 but I never go, hey. And I just eat it. It's bouncing around. It might come out as something else in the conversation. Might show up as her going, boy, he was crabby today. I don't know. But if I had been crabby because of, hey, here's what's going on for me, oh, okay, different thing. But none of us do this. None of, it's hard to do that. Because we're locked in a box. So you want to know how to get out of the box? You want to live outside the box? You want to think outside the box? Everybody says those things, right? Well, we all do. I agree. It's really hard to do. It's hard to do. It's hard to do because you start breaking through some of these things. You start going, my experiences don't me do not dictate who I am tomorrow. Yeah, really? Good luck with that one. It's a nice thing to say. My experiences don't dictate who I am going to be tomorrow, but try and live like that. You know? 
Oh, my family programming. That's a good one. Everybody goes, it was dad's fault. It was mom's fault. I blame that on my upbringing. Pop beat me with a belt. Blah, 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 blah. I don't care what the story is, right? You can break through that. Walt Disney broke through that. Walt Disney had a horrific childhood, a horrific, abusive childhood. He turned that around and went, I'm going to create a land where children are just happy all the time. And he created Disney World Disneyland. Other people have horrific experiences in their childhood and turn around and do it to the next child. Is stuff bouncing around? Or did he actually have the ability to take that fear and blow through a wall and go, I'm going to take that experience and make it something different. Oh boy, what did he do? Compassion, benevolence. Love. Yeah, love. Because when it comes right down to it, that's our core. That's really the core. So, you want to know how to live outside the box? I'm teasing you. <laughs> so, what we try and do, what we, there's a lot of ways to do that. And one of the ways that everybody's got this, everybody gets this, yeah? Yep. Okay. What we try and do are many things. The first thing, and quite honestly, the, and, and in a lot of ways the most important thing is just what we did. I want just to make you aware. <clears throat> and get it out of your head. Oh, well, this is who I am, and this is where I'm at, and this is, you know. And go, no, that's just not true. <clears throat> I've got those four walls around me. Everybody does. I have these primary emotions in me. Everybody does. Experiences are going to come at me from the time I'm born to the time I take my last breath. And I've got to allow this to express that appropriately. Appropriately. Yeah, I'm going to touch walking into people's businesses trying to kill everybody because they were fired. Well, that's, that's, that's a problem right here, man. <laughs> hey, just express it, dude, not with a gun, you know? But that's just what happens because what, that's kind of a crazy thing and kind of interesting. And there was another sad thing that happened today. I'll, I'll share that with you, too. But what happens is that core builds up so much. There's so much confusion going on. There's so much disruption. There's so much disbalance that when the, it, when the emotion's expressed, it's blaming others for how I feel. And if I can take it out on you, if I can take you out, then I'm going to feel better. It's never true. It's never true. But that's what's happening. There's such delusion there that that's really what occurs. They just start blaming others for it. Well, you made me feel that way. Well, that's a fib, guys. It's a hard one to live with, but nobody makes you feel a certain way. You decide to feel a certain way. You let that occur and respond in that way. Can you change those things? It's not easy, but sure you can. So that's really the kind of stuff we're talking about. <coughs> And, and it's so very important for people to have a connection, to have a connection with other human beings. I don't care if it's romantic. A good romantic relationship, a loving relationship is one of the most important things you can have in your life. It absolutely affects your health. It absolutely affects your health. If you have poor relationships, whether they're romantic or not, if you have poor work experiences, if you have anything like that in your life, start to seriously consider getting that out of your life declutter that circle for us. You want to you want to realize that you got those primary emotions in there and you've got those four walls around it and there's things you can do to start to shift that stuff. So relationships are deeply important. So today on the news I'm at home in my lunch break and this thing comes on and it just brought all this home for me. I don't know if you've seen this or not. It's, I think she was 16 years old girl on the internet holds up a piece of paper that says, this is really something. Did you see it? Yeah. I didn't see it. I didn't see it. It's all in her face. Some of us were working on that. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> It's been over. Ready? Um, Wait. This is fantastic. This is true for all of us. This is what she wrote and held up on the internet. I have no one. I need someone. And then she killed herself. And she killed herself. Yeah. Yeah. And she had this on there. Ready? That's it. Held it up on the internet on like a YouTube thing. Just that sign. And then she took her life. You have no idea how true this is for all of us, guys. If you have no one, you need someone. There's no doubt about it. And that can be, you can fill this with anything. This could be another human being. This could be a connection to God. This could be having faith in all that you can do. It doesn't matter. But we all need that 100%. There's no doubt about it. Because to live 
Okay, to survive, you need food, water, shelter, and love. You actually need love. You need those four things to survive. But there's a huge difference between surviving and thriving. Okay, there's a huge difference between just surviving and then really thriving. And if you pull love from somebody, and they've done experiments with monkeys, where they take a newborn monkey immediately away from the mother and segregate it from <coughs> all other monkeys, they go nut. They literally go psycho um, schizophrenic. They lose in touch with reality. They cannot be introduced back into the group. There's all kinds of violence and all this crazy stuff. It's because they never had a connection of love. It's so important. It's so important. So, you know, that's tragic, man. That's tragic. That girl's world, her box, was so tight around her circle and so jammed up with stuff that she saw no way out of the box. It's a shame. It's a shame. But we're all in that box. We're all in that box on some level. So how do we try and deal with this? For me, I'm very excited about doing this with you tonight because for me, I wanted to, the awareness is 50% of the battle. Just going, oh my gosh, this is a cool way to look at this. And it's not necessarily personal. There's nobody here that doesn't have all of those and isn't in those four walls, okay? So there's a technique that we do, which is a muscle response te te technique called emotional release technique. And what it does is it goes into the space between the core and those four walls, and it starts to energetically allow the body to release that from the organs. It allows it to just be flush from the organs. And it's helpful if you can come up with, oh, this is what it felt like when I was three. I remember dad leaving and not coming back for a while. I didn't know what was going on. I was very afraid, blah, 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 blah. Here's the story. Fabulous. It works even better if you can really remember what was going on. The technique also works if I can just say to somebody, can you think about what it's like to just feel over, overwhelmed? Just totally overwhelmed, you know? Just, just the world's crushing down on you, man. You got none, can't make a move. Sure, I don't need, necessarily need the specific story. Can you think about that feeling? Because what we're trying to get in touch with is the feeling. Because the feeling's the whole deal. Because the body will believe that feeling, whatever that feeling is, and it'll hold on to it. I say to people all the time, don't say, I don't want blah, blah, blah. Because the body doesn't understand the I don't want part. It's just understanding a different way of looking at our emotional state and the things that affect our emotions. The other part of it is the emotional release technique. Trying to, enter, trying to physiologically allow the body to release those old, unsupportive emotions and start to break down some of this stuff. You know what? Yeah, mom and dad were a certain way and we've got all that family history, but you know what? You don't have to necessarily go right down that road. They've proven that with foods. They realize now that foods actually turn our genes on or off, depending on the food we eat. And it's not about nutrition. It's actually about the information that the food has to the genes. So if I take somebody that their whole family has just, that is had diabetes, grandpa had diabetes, great grandpa had diabetes, 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 diabetes. There's a lot of practitioners that sit down and go, well, that is a genetic issue right there. They're going, you end up with diabetes. You've got to watch you, watch your diet. If I take that person out of that family experience, because they're taught how to eat, they're taught how to deal with stress, they're, what's their environment like? If I really segregate them out and I go, here's how you're going to eat, and we never turn that gene on through the information of the food, guess what? You're not going to get diabetes because we don't turn that gene on. And that is something that has been medically discovered, understood, pretty much uh, agreed upon. You know, it's really becoming a primary thing where a lot of docs are like, yeah, it's nutrition and it's information and your body deals with information in a certain way and that actually has a, an, a, an aspect of turning on the genes. Genes are a potential for things. They are not written in stone. They're really interesting. So how much stress is manifested through those four walls, holy mackerel. I gotta do what the society thinks is right. I gotta do what mom and dad thinks is right. My experiences tell me this, right? My environment tells me that. Holy mackerel, we're all living in a box. Start thinking outside the box. It's 50% of the battle. Just start thinking outside the box. Ha ha ha, you know. Start just looking at that. And then the other part of it is to realize, hey, if I'm dealing with, if I'm dealing with feeling overwhelmed, 
if I'm really dealing with feeling overwhelmed, there can be environmental components to that. Is it heavy metal load? Is it that the relationships in my life are completely unsupportive and I just, I can't make a move? Is it that there's things and people draining me? And what can I start to let go of? Because one of the things that happens here is most of us, most of you all, are, are doers. We get things done. The only value is when I do something and produce something and, and, and doing is the, is the thing we get accolades around. There's a problem with that. There has to be a balance to it. There has to be a balance. You also want to be a beer. My favorite song, Doobie Doobie Doo. You do and you be. You do and you be. You do and you be. And you start to balance it out a little bit. And that'll take a lot of emotional stress off of folks. A lot of times when we feel overwhelmed is because we've been in doing mode so much, the body just doesn't get a break. And then literally, whatever is not, phys uh, not emotionally expressed is physically expressed. Anything you emotionally suppress eventually, over time, will become physically expressed. It's just the body has to do it. It will always work to balance out that energetic stressors. And so, yeah, there's a certain amount of anger, frustration, resentment in my liver. There better be. That's, it's there for a reason. There's, there's a certain amount of grief, sadness, crying in my lungs. It's there for a reason. All appropriate responses, no doubt about it. They get all crazy and confused because it have four walls. And then how I find an inability to express because I'm afraid of the consequences of expressing straight through the wall. Because when you start to express straight through the wall, you're going to lose a lot of people. <laughs> you're, I mean, come on, you are. If you start to really do that and live like that, you're going to tweak some folks. Okay, you're going to tweak some, you're going to freak some people out. Go, well, hey, this is how I feel. This is how I expect. I hope you can handle that. Ooh, I feel better. <laughs> it's when we don't do that, we don't really feel good. And it's just a cool thing. It's a cool thing. So. Anybody, oh, we did pretty well time wise. I run late. Can we, can we get a little linear for a second? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, can you explain a little bit about how all those uh, emotions bouncing around from the core, going out not yeah. to the wall, then go back and make your pancreas, for instance, you talked about diabetes. Mm -hmm. and I was just thinking like, pancreas is low self-esteem, lack of control of yeah. distrust, disgust. Yeah. And oftentimes those are the same emotions attached to emotional eating, yeah. which links to... Right. Physiologically, long term, what that stress causes in the pancreas. is stress in the pancreas, which sure. then there you are, you're overweight and you have diabetes you have and diabetes. the emotions right. that you run in your life for those. Well, you explain it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, if, if I suppress specific emotions or if I tax specific organs, that's what I was trying to say, like, you know, if you have different kind of looks, if you tax specific organs, you may find that that starts. Listen, we've done some gentle detoxification with people through homeopathics. I've had this happen to myself. And, you know, heal detox kit, easy to do. A lot of you have done it. I've done it a lot. And, uh, you know, somewhere around the third or fourth week for me, I'm getting, like, snappy. <laughs> I was like, hey, 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 it's your liver. You know, I've been draining your liver for the last three weeks, and now you're a little, like, ah, irritable. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Forgot. So, sure, you can literally stress an organ, and you'll see the emotions come up. You'll see them come up. Hey, you can do the same thing by working, supporting the emotions, you're right, or supporting the organ and everything, and watch those specific emotions start to fade. We've got a gentleman we just started working with, great guy, I like him a lot. You know, he comes in with his wife, we're doing some little stuff, and I said, how are you, what's going on? And she was, and he's, he's a typical guy, and he's like, ah, I don't got nothing, you know, this is all hokum, as far as I'm concerned. I'm like, okay, cool. And she's sitting on the chair going, yeah, well, people at work are saying you're different. <laughs> Come on, right? Didn't the lady at work say you were so much nicer than we thought you couldn't believe it? Honest to goodness. And he was like, yeah, okay, right, well, I guess it's working. <laughs> it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. Where, who, come on, how many of us have ever been taught anywhere that, oh, your liver's all about the anger, it's not you, it's your liver's stressing out. Well, what, really? <laughs> None of us have ever taught that stuff, right? So, you know, oh, I have asthma. My lungs are, are, are funky. I've got asthma issues as a kid. Hey man, that's, that can be wrapped around sadness and grief and crying and, 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 and feeling stuck. So, you know, that asthma is an expression. Now, can you just go, oh, one absolutely causes the other? No, of course not. 
they're all mushing around, figuring it out. How do I really feel? Little lung, little liver, little small intestine. This is how I am right now. So that's what we're looking at. Remember, you got those four walls. Everybody does and everyone's dealing with them. Some lean more on mom and dad. Some lean more to the social dogmas. Some, some have more tendency to the environmental stuff. You know, some go, oh, it's all about my experiences, and I'm not doing that again because this happened when I did that. Okay, so just kind of play with that and look at that, and that's what I really wanted to bring to you more than anything else tonight. Almost everyone here knows the technique and have done that technique with me. It's a fantastic technique. Tonight, I really wanted to hit this idea and get everyone to try and balance this out. Do and be. And B means I am sitting on my porch swing and I'm looking at the clouds and I'm listening to the trees and I'm watching the birds and somebody says, what are you thinking about? And you go, nothing. And that's perfect. Perfect. And do that for 20 minutes. And then get up and do something. Okay? I do it all day. <laughs> and you got to do more. Bounce it out. Okay? Because I can fall right into being a beer. Oh, man, I'll be all day. I could be all day long. But if I don't do things, that gets weak too. It gets weak. If anything that dominates like that becomes an issue for us. It does. So, any other questions? Yes. Go. On the subject of leaving your box. Yeah. yeah. And you're expressing that to someone. Yeah. Should that offend them and fill their box at the same time? Well, that's like saying, you know, I make people feel a certain way. And I think you have to I think you have to have a sensitivity to another human being because they're in the box and they're gonna react and all of that. But I think you can express ninety-nine percent of all emotions, especially if you're going to express the emotion in a non-reactive way. Most people get hurt because it's a reaction. Err, rah, 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 rah. That's different than taking a moment, being for a second, and then going, hey, I need to tell you that, you know. I forget what you did the other day, but we were kidding around. I said, I said something like, oh, I changed the dog's water. And she was like, thanks, I did the dishes. And, and the books. We, and the and books. The and, the and I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't telling you I did that for a thank you. But see, we have boxes. And I went, and I just wanted to tell her, hey, I did the dog bowl. Not, not for the accolades, but hey. Hey, the dog stuff for you, isn't that nice? <laughs> well, that's what I was looking for, you know, come on, right? And, and but. What's cool with her and I is that we've done an awful lot of this work, and the minute we went Teddy t -t 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 back and forth, ba -ba 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 -ba, we went, <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day I said something I forget. You know, I came down and I was like, I took out the garbage. Hey, I took out the garbage, <laughs> and she said something, and we went, and it's pretty funny, huh? Uh -huh. If it's not what you say; it's what you say. Yeah, man, absolutely, absolutely. Go ahead. Well, I just want to, and I'll get to. Shown's question, but I just want to talk about the emotional work and under, make sure everybody understands that because there hasn't. I'm. I think that was fabulous, and for me, linear thinker. I want to make sure everybody understands how going in and you know going through the emotional work that you're doing helps empty that box, yes. or or it cuts the cord, so to speak. <clears throat> like that's the way I've always understood it from the way he expressed it is. You know, there's buttons that my family, for instance, that Pushes. whole family programming had lots of that. And they could push buttons on me that were unbelievable. They would use the word it, because my brother called me it for 10 years. And everybody in home, my hometown called me it. Nobody used my name. And so if somebody <laughs> used the word it in a sentence, I got hot, heated, pissed off, angry, right. like beyond belief. Up until, you know, my 30s, he would come in the room and the word it would Bother. be mentioned and I'd be like, so he ran some of the emotional work and found, you know, it was in my liver, maybe it was in my pancreas, caused low self-esteem. You know, I was a very stick figure, short-haired girl that looked more like a boy, and that's probably why he did that. And I was tomboyish, so, you know, low self-esteem. And then the anger issue from my liver made me really pissed off at him. So once we released that, he could now say it to me to this day. And it doesn't cause the button to push anymore. It's not he, an immediate reaction. He yeah. can go, hey, man. You know, you did that when I was seven. Come on, let go of that. But it's not the immediate seven. reaction. It's not the immediate reaction <laughs> of, oh, that makes me feel a certain way. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I have no control over myself on some level. And what I found is over the last three to four years now, he doesn't even try it because it's not fun for him. 
Uh -huh. You know, there are certain personalities that like to push those buttons. There are yep. other personalities that are real sensitive to those buttons. And everybody, there's a lot of people in the middle. So what the emotional technique has allowed me freedom to have a relationship with different family members, even though they're pushing those buttons, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. That's your issue, not my issue. That's really his low self-esteem. Yeah. Of course. I have what I've learned. Hopefully you never see this video. That was his <laughs> love. <laughs> um, he won't believe it anyway. It's all welcome. Yeah. Um, you know, it's his low self-esteem around his issues that he's got, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's a whole other issue. So, you know, the emotional release technique and trying to empty the space between our core and the walls of what we're talking about, that space is where all the extra stuff gets filled up. So to start to read, and what happens when that gets all filled up, you lose a little bit of free will because you're in reaction mode. It's more about reacting to what's happening. A lot of times I'll say, they're just blowing in the wind like a leaf, man. And the next thing that comes along, somebody says, bah, 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 bah. they go, oh, that's what exactly what I'm gonna do. And then somebody goes, da, 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 and I read it on the internet, and then now they're doing that. Whoa, man, you're just, you're going through reactions. You're not gonna get anywhere. You're gonna get lost. You're gonna feel, and it just keeps piling up. So for us, the emotional release technique starts to, my goal is to just create more free will. More free will. More free will. If I can eliminate the deep emotional cathexes, the excess energy in around grief, for instance, for somebody's life, it gives them more free will. And that is the key. If we can get to a point where you have this, no. If we can get to a point where, yeah, where we've emptied this box out to a degree, it's much easier to penetrate through the walls. It's much easier to actually have those things come in and deal with them in a different way. It's two directions, always two directions. Stuff's coming in and going out. Stuff's being expressed. I'm feeling this, I'm expressing that. I'm feeling this, I'm expressing that. If we can get rid of all of the experiences and the programming and the beliefs and all the stuff that has happened to me, okay, and we can start eliminating some of this. Not the memory of it. Nope, not the memory, but the, the excess energy around it. What happens is the person goes, oh, yeah. they can call me in, I don't really feel anything around it. And, on, and honestly, what, you, what manifests oftentimes is the person calling the person it, it suddenly just fades away. They don't do it anymore. They don't do it because that button isn't there. And if the button isn't there, my nine nervous system doesn't find it anymore. It's really amazing. So our goal in doing the work is to try and release some of this stuff so that it's not a trigger, it's not a button anymore that causes some kind of issue. You have more and more free will. And when that happens, I'm not kidding you, you go into the world of, it's true. You'll drop fear. Fear will start to disappear. Fear will start to disappear because 99% of things we're all afraid of are absolutely never gonna happen, the 1%, 10% is going to happen, all your worry and all your fear around it ain't going to stop it either. So it's a big waste of time, you know, fear and worry. You can find that everywhere, fear and worry. So, you know, the more that this clears out and you have a feeling of freedom <coughs> to, to connect with some of this stuff, yeah, you start to lose the fear, you start to be filled more with that benevolence and that compassion, okay? Uh, that's long-lasting, powerful love. So, <coughs> Shirley, you had a question, right? I'm trying to understand this when I'm uh, listening to all this and knowing more and more. Yeah. This box is very full. I think Lauren is my daughter. Yeah. She is autistic. There we go. And she is definitely full of emotion. And how old is she? She's 20. Oh, wait, hold on. I've got a female that's 20 that's filled with emotion. <laughs> I don't care if she's autistic or not. Find me a female that's 20 that's not filled with emotions. Flying all over the place. I'll be honest with you. I mean, it's it's a tough situation. But there's a lot about Lauren that's absolutely appropriate. Yeah. She's thinking about these boys, how these boys are treating her. This one's dating that one. That bugs me. This one likes it. And when we have a toxic load in our it, body, that's why I wrote environmental up there. Contributing a huge contributing factor to particularly autism. Emotions will link with toxins, toxins absolutely. and store in the body. And when we release toxins, out come the emotions. 
Yep. And you know, I want to go back to that story you were telling earlier about the gentleman that came in, and you know, his wife was like, "Oh, but remember that girl? It works. Yeah. That you're yeah. so different." His symptoms weren't I'm crabby. No. He came in because he had He's peripheral, strange, physiological symptoms sick. that nobody could, could figure, figure out. out. And he went to Dr. Liu, our the, one of the biological dentists that we work with, and Dr. Liu was like, you got too much going on. I'm not touching the mercury in your he mouth. He had the stuff in his teeth, you know. Mouth. You need to go work with a with this clinic to make sure that you're strong enough to handle To go this. through the process. So as we started to open up drainage, get his body to drain out his limbs, his kidneys, his bowels, his lungs, which are the detoxification pathways. Not on an emotional level, on right. a physiological level. We're doing some, to those taking organs. some homeopathics, right. taking some detox stuff, and then I did do some oh, emotional yeah. work with him as well. Which he just loved. He then <laughs> began, the drainage started to happen, and then he got strong enough to start to do an IV. Yeah. Or to start to get a quadrant done. He did a quadrant, did an IV, very reactive. He is full. And so as he is... You know, and then he got more emotional and he had some stuff come up and he wasn't psyched about that because, you know, he's a typical male. So when you when you have toxins in your body, you're going to release emotions. I know it came to me just as I said that. You know, and it, it often and it surprises because, us yeah. because we're like, well, why does that link to Well, it doesn't surprise us, but it surprises well, the person they're going through. It's, you know? It doesn't seem logical, but right. this is exactly how the body works. It's not necessarily logical how the body works. It's, it's perfect in how it works because this is how it's protected us from both the toxin and the emotion yeah. from causing all this undue stress. And it's stored up in our body. And as we release it, it's not often pretty. You know, when we dump that rain barrel, I always talks about that. You know, you might get diarrhea. You might get the, you might get diarrhea in your mouth. I had diarrhea in my mouth for five years when I first started seeing it. And I was telling everybody exactly how I felt. I became Blunt Kelly instead of mm -hmm. Corner Kelly. They didn't talk to anybody. And I was like the little mouse in the corner that never said anything. And then I started doing emotional work. And then I pissed everybody in my life off and went from having a family to not having a family. Went from having a ton of friends to but having very all few come friends. Back yeah, that's all. Yeah, I'm softer now. How do you release all this? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, after Lauren was immense. Yeah. For 24 hours. And she did come down. Yeah. But she she is different. She is um, clingy. Mm -hmm. She's become clingy. Mm -hmm. Which is fine, but eventually this will come full yeah. circle. Yeah. It, this is just part of the process. Yeah. You know, like I said, especially she's since not, we're detoxifying her the way we are. She's not going to get better in a couple IVs. No. You know, no. she's probably going to have to do 40, 50, 60 IVs over the course of five, six years or less time. And her body's going to go through the process. We're dynamic beings that are always constantly changing. And as we change the internal environment, the external environment will change too. Yes, there and is no surely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and it's not unusual for everybody that goes through that experience in regards to really doing serious detoxification, trying to handle heavy metal loads and all of that stuff, to have emotional stuff come up absolutely. is absolutely uh, typical. Yeah. You know, typical. Where people are like, I'm crying, I don't know why. I'm really angry. And I, you know, well, absolutely. what should you be doing? Um, like, what can I do for her to help support it and, and make it easier for her? Try and help her through some of these barriers that are set up. You're doing that here, really handling the environmental load and the toxins and yeah. stuff like that, you know? So, you know, she feels supported at home. You know, yeah. what are her experiences? Well, her experiences right now are all about <laughs> romantic love. And, yeah. and you know what? That's appropriate at 20. It's a bit yeah. of a tough yeah. thing for you because of her total situation. Yeah. But she's caught up in that right now. Yeah. But she's 20. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate. Yeah. That's a little tough on mom. Because she's not handled like a typical 20-year-old would, which would not tell mom a thing. She comes home from school and goes, rah, 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 here's all my drama. <laughs> hey, you're 20, you got a lot of drama. I don't necessarily need to hear it, but with Lauren, we need to hear it. Because I want her to emote it. Because the more I keep her in here and not let her emote it, the tougher it's going to be. So, you know, I would, I would look at, you know, hey, Lauren, there's certain things when we're out in society, you just have to act a certain way, you expect to be a certain thing. I know that might not feel right. And but help her through even, some of that stuff. But but there's another factor here that I think that is going on that it, she must be just so full that she's a little delusional. Well, because some, yeah, of what, well, sure. some of what she's thinking is not, like she actually believes it too. Yeah, of <laughs> course, but remember this, 
right? No. It's personal experiences, whether they're whether they're perceived or real. She could be sitting in her room going, they just hate me. They this one just and that's not true at all. But if she perceives that, it's real. So you know, you're up against a lot. For us, you know, I mean, we've done a lot of emotional work with her. I'm trying to focus in on detoxifying her now just because she went, okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Yo, know, baby. <laughs> yes, you will. Here we go. You <laughs> said the wrong thing now, man. And she's awesome. She's, and keep you know. her up with a Corella. Keep her oils up because her body is dumping oils, yep. the, the shedding, the outside layer of the cell, and the, the phospholipid layer, which is why we get the push of the phospholip uh, phosphatidylcholine. And keep her oils up the good oils like hemp oil and flaxseed oil and pumpkin oil and good butter mm -hmm. and good fats uh, you know what's her blood type i forget a, a. yeah so avocado those kind of things like give her good good fats it'll help replenish that outside layer which is shedding and then the greens to help absorb all those toxins you know maybe doing a little bit of emotional work through the process as she gets some of this done because again the toxins come out, the emotions come out, and that They're it's linked together. helping her deal with that so free will can take over versus this reactionary, you know, oh, when I feel love, then I fall in love, and I get hyper right, to that person, right, and then right, I go right. through this process, and I've been through it eight times in five and two years, and a half years, and, and, and that do, relationship's and over, and I'm single for a year, and then I do it again, and I had friends doing that, man, I was like, dude, this is the third woman you're doing this, and I did it too, okay? We run patterns, and then when you look back, you go, wow! I can't believe that. You know, it's a total pattern. I fell in love with the same person five times. Can't, you know? can't help it. Can't help it. So there's a part of that for me, which is what we call a cathexis, the person stuck in a little loop. It's like a loop, right, that's running. And there's also a place of the body's going, you're going to keep falling in love with the same person until you figure this out, dude. You got a message. You got a, you got a lesson to be learned here. You're going to keep tripping over the same curve until you figure out you got to pick your foot up. And honest to goodness, that's a way the body's trying to handle some of this stuff. So it's re it is really interesting. Anybody have any other questions? Any other questions? Um, you, uh, you didn't mention it tonight, but no. cellular memory. Cellular memory, yes. It's something that, for example, something happened as a little girl, mm -hmm. and, and the cells remember, mm -hmm. but your brain doesn't remember it. Well, yeah. I mean, for me, cellular memory is the same concept as, um, um, uh, you know, uh, it's a hard, it's, it's almost a hardwired program that makes that happen. When people talk about cellular memory, it's, it's a hardwired program on some level. And so that can be released through this work, those types of things. Uh, I, um, it's not all reality though, like, you know, it physically happened, like dreams yeah. can well, cause a cellular memory okay. and, and set things up and dreams are just, you know, of course, reflections of what we didn't deal with in the day and all that other stuff. Sure. But, Cellular memory is, is being able to to handle the perception of what happened to you. Like, you know, I mean, it's a horrible example, but it's the only one I can think of. You know, there are some little girls or little boys that are looked at by men, older men or older women even, that can make them feel like they were not, that, that was inappropriate, okay? But it doesn't mean that they were actually touched right. or anything else. Right. Their body perceived it as Perception. though they said, as though they did, and that doesn't matter. He's taught me that from day one. Doesn't it's matter. Your body if your body perceives happened. it, then it's true. This emotional work does not confirm nor right. deny historical, historical events. Like it's true. what your body so to perceive. Things is it. happening. We've all been to different movies. You know, we go to a movie with whoever, our spouse. We go and leave the movie, and he's like, "Oh, that was the greatest action scene ever." I was like, "Oh, what? I thought it was a love movie. What are you talking about?" Uh, we yeah, just totally perceive, two different experiences. Yeah, totally perceive the movie very differently. Yeah. He remembers certain things about the movie. I remember other right. things. And we're like, did you see that movie? Did you? I mean, the, 7 to 10 percent, right. first of all. Because right. we only retain 7 to 10 percent of anything we hear or see the first time we ever see it. So you only get 10 percent of tonight, you know. Um, there's emotions and, you know, we live in a box and so on. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to get out of the box. We're going to get lit outside the box. But the cellular memory can be flushed out by doing the emotional work, whether it's real or not. It's perceived as real, and that's all that's important. Yep. We couldn't do it ourselves because we really don't know. No, it's hard to. Yeah, it's hard to. Because, <laughs> yeah, because what happens is our conscious mind has very little to do with the connections of the emotional body. And so, typically, what is believed at this point is that about 10% of our experiences 
our conscious mind. In other words, you know, some of us know where we parked the car tonight. You remember where you parked the car tonight. That's conscious mind. You know that we're a true wellness and here it is, it's 8.15. Okay, it's conscious mind. But it doesn't have a lot to do with how you feel. Literally, 90%, <clears throat> somewhere around 90% of how we act and react on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is actually based on how the body feels about things, not what the mind thinks about things. And for me, this, this is the witness. Can I get a witness? This is watching my life. This one's driving my life in regards to how I feel about things. This is what I like to think of as super conscious. It doesn't necessarily transfer up here and I become aware of it. Unless you do a lot of this work and you start to get, and you understand these walls and you start to realize, hey, that's how I'm playing. This is what's going on for me. You can become more and more conscious of that. But this is all about the feeling and this is all about the perception and, and the, the, the memory banks. You know, I'm going to end with this. She asked me about memory and where is memory and what they've discovered is and they, here's how they did it they took a rat and they trained a rat to go through a maze to get his food they do this all the time it doesn't you know train a rat go through a maze get his food and what they did is this doctor took the rat after the rat understood how to do that talk about cellular memory and he took the rat and he started slicing the brain out of the rat and he put it back in the rat did the same thing take the rat out slice more of the brain away put it back in Find the food, son of a gun. Slice more brain. They slice so much of the rat's brain away that he was completely paralyzed, messed up, a dysfunctional rat. But he literally was able to drag himself through the maze and get to the food. And the, 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 the conclusion was, memory is not in the brain. It's just not in the brain. Where is it? Well, the, you got three brains. You got your heart, it's a brain. You got the stomach, it's a brain. You got the one in your skull, it's a brain. The belief now is that this brain <clears throat> is a transmitter and a receiver, just like a radio. I can send messages out, I can bring messages in. <clears throat> but there's no memory in my brain. They believe, I do too, that all that information, all of our memory stuff, all of that is held out here in, in nothingness. And when you say, oh, when I was 17, you're actually getting information at a memory bank out there that goes, oh, when you were 17, all this stuff happened. But it's not in your body. It's not in your head. They don't know where it is. They don't know where memory is. So I, I agree. I think memory is out in the matrix some way, and we can tap into it. Albert Einstein actually started to, he, he didn't know it necessarily, but he actually kind of turned that idea on. Because when they asked Albert Einstein, hey, how do you come up with these great, amazing, ridiculous E equals MC squared? He literally <laughs> said to him, well, I think of the question, and then I wait for the answer. I just concentrate on the question. Hmm, how's the universe put together? Hmm. And he doesn't try and formulate anything. He just goes, I keep asking the question, and eventually that information comes in. It's not mine. Ask, talk to an artist. Talk to good artists. They'll tell you. They sit down in front of the canvas, and they go, well, I don't know. They wait for that information to come. And when that happens, the person that's experiencing that is totally lost. They don't experience time in the same way. You know, have you ever, you know, you know artists that are just, the whole house is paint, their clothes are paint, I don't think about anything else, I'm just creating. Well, that's not them. They're drawing, they're connected, and they're drawing that in. Musicians do the same thing. I played an amazing riff. Yeah, was it you? Well, no, man, it's just happening. <laughs> When you're in those places of just happening, that's it. That's it right there. That's beautiful. So Alzheimer's, the receiver's blocked. Yeah, good. And the, and the idea of the body being able to take information, disseminate it down through the body, remember that the receiver's blocked. Right on, the receiver's is blocked. Yeah, good way to look at it. And okay, with Alzheimer's, what's blocking the receiver? Well, they're, they're seeing that uh, aluminum yeah. is placking on my brain. It's blocking the reception. I don't get a good signal. So yeah, it, it's a good way to look at it. Good way to look at it. So this is a receiver transmitter. This guy actually is the one that's responsible for the responses of the emotions. Our heart gives more information to our brain than our brain gives to the rest of the body. The heart is constantly telling your brain what's going on. Your gut does the same thing. Same thing. Oh, I had a feeling. I, I felt in my gut. He was a wacko. I knew before I walked in, I just had a weird, strange feeling in my stomach. Should have went with that. Yep. He broke my heart. 
people, I mean, you know, so I think, really? Yeah, I mean, they've done studies of heart attack victims. <clears throat> Something like one third of all heart attack victims, when they open, fatal heart attack victims, when they open them up and they look at the heart, there's no dysfunction. They hide a heart attack and die, but there's no damage or dysfunction to the heart. Most heart attacks, most heart attacks occur on, on Sunday nights and Monday mornings. I don't want to get up and go to work. I'm done. I'm, a, I'm not kidding you not. I ran, an am, I ran with an ambulance squad for a number of years. We knew Sunday nights and Mondays what you're going to be dealing with. Heart attacks. Nobody wants to go back to work. The stress of it. They'll go. That heart just goes, that's it, man. I'm doing this again. Yeah, interesting. How many of us know people or suffer ourselves with digestive problems? There's emotional connections to that. There's, you know, how many of us go, oh, i got to get up on stage. I'm all right now. Your gut has issues, right? Donovan McNabb, remember that? I'm in the Super Bowl. It's really exciting. Hold on, i got to give her all this uh, Gatorade, right? Hey, man, that's a natural response. That's a natural thing. It's a brain. It's a brain. This is a receiver transmitter. Play with that for a minute. Hmm. What information am I receiving? What information am I transmitting out to the matrix that's going to eventually manifest my reality? That's really the way you want to look at your brain. That's a tough one breaking through the box there. So we need to keep an open mind. Yeah, an open mind. Live outside the box. Right. I would like to thank everybody tonight for being here. I know Kelly's got a couple of announcements uh, uh, in regards to things that are coming up in the office. We have two yoga classes come up. One is not this weekend, the 27th, and that's at 8.30 <coughs> with Miss yeah. Jess. Is that true? 27? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. She just had a funny look like I was wrong. Yeah. The next one is November 2nd, and that's with Becky, a friend of Linda Sue's, our reflexologist, who's here tonight. And to Tammy Lee? Yes. Tammy, Tammy is our Tammy. new... Massage that's a lens our new reflexologist. If you don't know what reflexology is, come in and get your feet rubbed and then you'll know all about it. <laughs> and you'll fall in love with it. It's a way to access all your organs through your feet and you'll be surprised what comes up for you emotionally. A lot of times her and I, it's fabulous. A client will come in, see her for, for the session and then come right into my room and go, let's see what's up. You know, it's fantastic. Stimulate all those organs. All those organs, yeah. And then uh, we also have a massage therapist as well, uh, Tammy, who just started today. So if you'd like to uh, talk to us about that, let us know. But anyway, uh, Linda Sue's friend is a yoga instructor as well, and she's going to be coming in and doing a couple classes for us. Uh, November 2nd is one she's doing at 9 o'clock in the morning, um, which is a Friday. You have 8 a.m. ring. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It is. It's 8 a.m. 8 a.m. We start at 9. 8 a.m. Um, and they're just five dollars. We just asked for a quick donation to the instructors. It goes to the instructor. And for us, it's just you know, any it's they're all level classes. It doesn't matter your level. It doesn't matter if you've done yoga for years or it's your first class. Bring them at. Come and have fun. And they're fabulous instructors. They're going to help you understand how to get your body moving because it's all important. You know, we're we're an all inclusive clinic from the standpoint of we're not just here to handle you know, your medicaments or your emotional work or something. You know. We want you to change your lifestyle so you're not dependent upon us or anybody else. You're living a healthier lifestyle. And the last one is the basics. The last basics of the year is November 8th at 7 o'clock, which is a Thursday night. Um, we never do a workshop in December for obvious reasons. It's a tight month right. for yeah. everybody. Um, but So November 8th is the last one. I will be doing that, of course. And I think that's it. Thanks so much for being here tonight, guys. I really Thank appreciate you. taking the time. Sauerkraut is, um, well, it's, it's sauerkraut itself or sauerkraut juice? I don't know. So sauerkraut juice is the cure-all, you know, it's not really cure-all, but it's kind of like Regula. Are you familiar with Regula, the product Regula? So Regula is a seven-year processed fermented food. It's walnut and lemons and blah, 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 blah. It's a whole bunch of foods that are fermented. And it literally takes seven years to make a batch of it. Okay. And it's vinegary. A shot of it. Whoop, and you're supposed to keep it in your mouth for 15 minutes. Good luck. Um, and before you swallow it. Yeah. Funny. It's funny for those of us who drink it. Um, and it's, what it does is when you have fermented foods like that, and that's what sauerkraut juice is. It's a fermented food. It helps oxygenate the blood, it's an immune booster, and it helps pull acid out of the body. And, you know, if you want to get real general, pulling acid out of the body is an anti-aging process. Pulling toxins out of the body is anti-aging. There's no anti-aging creams that work topical or anything like that. You want to anti-age, you take toxins out of the body and stay ahead of the acid. So is it alkalining? 
It's alkalizing. Yes. Alkalizing. Let's go. Alkalizing. Yes. Now, if I'm an oat blood type, am I supposed to have vinegar or cabbage? Then that would be good. Well, that's not necessarily true because it's a fermented product. So you're not eating sauerkraut, you're eating a product that's fermented. It's totally different. And it's not like eating, I mean, I'm not an alcohol person, but I know some alcohols are fermented and I don't even ask me which yeah. one. But, um, you know, that's a whole different process. This is a healthy bacteria creating process. Remember, we're more bacteria than we are cells. We are more bacteria than we are cells. We're just bags of bacteria walking around. So is fermenting almost always a good thing to choose to eat them? Something yes, fermented. yes, as long as it doesn't, you know, give you acid reflux or something like that. You're well, probably doing too you much of it. Tummy ache if you're really acidic in your body? Well, it's a, you know, it's, it's pulling acid. Less is more, you know, yes, yeah, so you want to go slow. You don't want to go, oh, I'm going to drink a gallon of sauerkraut juice today. You know, if you've never had it before, I mean, regular, the dosage is a shot. Sometimes when we muscle test people, right, it'll be like, Wow, your body wants 11 shots. You never start anybody doing 11 shots. I mean, that's insanity. It's too much too fast. Your body might be congruent with that, but your digestive tract might pay you hell to in order to do that. I mean, we love muscle testing, but we don't override our education with a muscle test. So, you know, why don't you start with one shot, but as soon as you can build up to two, that'd be awesome. See how one shot makes you feel, especially if you've never had fermented products. Uh, kombucha. Anybody familiar with kombucha tea? That's a fermented product. You know, and that's why it says on the bottle, don't drink this if you're pregnant or have immune problems or talk to your physician. I, I, the first three months of this, of this pregnancy, if I didn't drink kombucha tea, I don't know what would happen. It totally helped my nausea. It's good bacteria for the gut. So it creates the proper population in the gut to build our immune system, which is where all the disease stems from, is in the gut. Another huge generalization. Is I it love good for kids too? Fermented things. Good for kids too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, his <coughs> daughter, Elena, basically came out of the womb sipping regular. She loves it. She's like, she drinks Corel and gets a green mustache. You know? Oh yeah, she loves it. Because she's never known anything different. She'll drink flaxseed right off the spoon. Like, oh, can I have some flaxseed? Oh, a treat. It's all what you train it to be. Then she doesn't know any better, you know? 